Throughout history, it has always been the men who fight the wars. But that's not to say that women have not been victims. Women in war zones suffer many the same things as men. Injury, disease, starvation, murder, whilst also suffering their own unique issues, such as sexual enslavement or violence and forced pregnancy. With the extreme animosity between the warring Germans and Russians of World War II came an extreme want for revenge, and the Soviet occupation of East Germany made this vengeance easily accessible. This led to 1948 being the worst year ever for women. In the last days of World War II, Germany was occupied by the British, Americans, French, and Russians, and the country would be carved up into four zones. Russia reigned over 42 million of the former German state and 19.1 million of its citizens. The period was incredibly difficult for the women of Germany in all the occupied zones, but especially the Soviet zone of occupation. Food could only be obtained as charity from the occupying forces. Millions of homes were destroyed. Infant mortality was high, and women were victims of brutal assaults. The occupation began in 1945, and Soviet soldiers, many of whom had relatives, friends, and lovers killed or abused by the Nazi regime, had essentially free reign for three years until 1948. So between 1945 and 1948, Soviet soldiers prowled the streets, searching for ways to enact their revenge on the German people. No one was spared, not even the elderly or very young. Life in the immediate post-war period was tough. Germany had suffered five and a half million military deaths, all of whom were fathers, brothers, or sons. Many women found themselves without their male family members and were left to fend for themselves amongst the blood-soaked ashes of Germany, or as it was now known, the German Democratic Republic. A total of 240,000 women are believed to have died after suffering gender-specific violence. Life amongst the rubble. Violence was not the only danger. The war left Germany with significant shortages of fuel and food. Its factories were now piles of rubble, and much of its workforce was dead or imprisoned. Starvation and extreme poverty were major problems, and women had to fight to keep themselves and their children alive. East Germany suffered especially. While the Americans and British had invested monetarily in West Germany, at their own great expense, the Soviet sector was sucked dry of wealth. As part of German reparations to the Soviet Union, with over $10 billion being siphoned out of the country by way of factories, raw materials, and manpower. Women played a vital role in the physical reconstruction of Germany. Rubble lined the streets of its cities. Farmland was pockmarked with artillery craters. And mines and unexploded ordnance lined the countryside. 6.5 square kilometers of the city of Dresden was destroyed, while 16 square kilometers of Berlin also lay in waste. In Germany, there were 400 million cubic meters of rubble that needed clearing. The Soviet occupiers established the Nationales Aufbauwerk, to organize the clearing and reconstruction. The women who worked amongst the destruction were referred to as Trümmerfrau, rubble women. These rubble women worked nine hours a day, with only one short break. In payment, they received an unsatisfactory daily ration, along with 72 pfennig, or pence. This was less than 3.6 Reichsmarks for a week's work. In contrast, the average German worker in 1939 earned 190 marks a week over 50 times more. The work was menial, but physically taxing. One typical job was the human conveyor, where a long line of women would pass rubble and bricks from one end to the other. Women also crushed rubble by hand, shoveled broken stones, and stacked bricks ready for transportation. What little money they did earn had to be spent on food, as the daily ration was not enough to sustain hard physical labor. Life in Exile Many ethnic German civilians were also deported from their homes and sent to do forced labor in the extreme eastern reaches of the Soviet Union, such as Siberia and Kazakhstan. One study found that around 400,000 German civilians, both living within Germany and ethnic Germans in Russia, were deported, 160,000 dying during their imprisonment. The deportations were incredibly disorganized. Men and women were allowed to bring 200 kilograms of belongings, but the wagons rarely had room to carry any more than the deportee could carry in their hands. Even when there was room, Soviet guards often forced them to leave their belongings behind. 
They were supposed to bring with them one month's worth of food and provisions, but this was usually impossible. The Red Army was also ordered to separate the heads of families from the rest, meaning many women were left without their husbands or fathers. Children were also sometimes left behind altogether. In one area, over 50,000 women were deported, leaving behind almost 6,500 children. The journey itself was dangerous, with many children and elderly or sick women dying before reaching their destination. These would be unceremoniously buried along the track, or, if there was no stop, thrown off the moving wagon. Upon arrival, the chances of survival were not much better. One particularly extreme case tells of a mother of seven who lost six of her children to malnutrition within a few months of her arrival. After the seventh died a short while later, the mother sat at her children's burial place, the body of her seventh child in her arms, until she died. Contrary to what one might assume, many of the deportation camps known as special settlements had more women than men due to the large number who had perished in the war. In one camp, housing 550,530 adult inmates, 351,008 were women. In another, there were 3,387 women to 1,656 men and 3,566 children. Many of the work sites were staffed mostly or entirely by women. The Molotov oil refinery had 2,380 female workers and only 10 male workers. The Soviet regime allowed Germans to perform only the hardest labor, such as in the timber industry or unloading freight wagons by hand. This work was hazardous and took a heavy toll on the body. Overworking and malnutrition caused women to age prematurely, with women in their 30s being confused for the very elderly. The harsh conditions also affected women's menstrual cycles, and many went years without ever having a period. This had an especially strong effect on the women, who viewed this as a loss of their womanhood. One victim lamenting her perceived loss of womanhood recalls another woman saying to her, where are you supposed to find extra blood to give up? Women could work 16 hour days for two or three weeks without any time off. And they were fed only the bare minimum necessary to maintain their ability to work. The use of German labor in lighter work, such as in offices or in the service sector, was explicitly prohibited. This intense work crippled women's bodies and many suffered with chronic pain from joint damage and arthritis. There were also many serious injuries, especially amongst the women in the logging industry who, unlike the men, had little to no experience in heavy industry. Blood for Blood Rape was officially illegal amongst the Soviet troops, but this did not stop officers and officials from turning a blind eye to it. Some soldiers were tried for this offense, but this was a rare occurrence. Some officers may have had compassion, but most believed in an eye for an eye, or blood for blood. The German invasion of Russia was bloody and brutal, and so must be the Russian occupation of Germany. Stalin himself said, when Yugoslav partisans complained of these crimes by Russian forces committed by Russians against their own allies, understand it. If a soldier who has crossed thousands of kilometers through blood and fire and death has fun with a woman, or take some trifle. Soviet propaganda would go so far as to even blame the majority of attacks on Germans in disguise, especially the SS werewolf battalions. This kind of violence was so prevalent that West Berliners referred to the Soviet war memorial in Berlin as the tomb of the unknown rapist. No woman was free from danger, and neither the innocence of childhood nor the dignity of old age could protect them. Girls as young as nine and women as old as 80 were attacked. The Soviet psyche blamed the entire German race for the crimes committed, and everyone was to be punished equally. One Soviet veteran recalled, there were not enough women, so we had to take young 12 or 13 year olds. Hanna Lura Kohl, wife to former German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, was thrown from a window after being abused by a gang at the age of 12. The extent of the violence and the reasons for it are made clear in a poem by Soviet captain Alexander Zolzhenitsyn. The little daughters on the mattress dead. How many have been on it? A platoon? A company, perhaps? A girl's been turned into a woman. A woman turned into a corpse. It's all come down to simple phrases. Do not forget. Do not forgive. Blood for blood. A tooth for a tooth. Those who fell pregnant usually sought 
termination of pregnancy, which were only available on the illicit market, perhaps performed by unqualified men and using dangerous methods. These back alley activities were unsafe, and it is believed that as many as 10,000 women died from their complications. Those women who carried their children to term often lost a child anyhow, due to the extreme deprivation immediately following the armistice, such as the lack of food and medicine. The infant mortality rate in post-war Berlin is thought to have been as high as 90%. Women did not only suffer physical trauma, the mental anguish could often be as bad as the physical, especially in a society that praised female fidelity and purity. Women were frequently driven to take their own lives by the experience itself and by society's response to it. Many could not endure the pain of their experiences, while some were forced by their fathers to kill themselves, as the fathers could not live with the daughter who had been dishonored. Some female victims could not find protection in their own homes and with their own husbands. Some husbands, suffering their own unique problems in this bleak new world, murdered their own wives for the imagined betrayal of consenting to relations with enemy invaders. Many women were victims of multiple attacks, some as many as 60 or 70 times, all from different men. There were very few ways a woman could protect themselves. One method was to form a relationship with a Russian officer, or a particularly influential soldier. They would still be subject to unwanted intercourse, but they may prevent themselves from becoming the victim of multiple men. Women also tried to make themselves ugly and unattractive. They would use coal dust and oil to dirty their faces and wear dirty, tattered rags. This lawlessness would continue until the winter of 1948, when the Soviet administration confined soldiers to their guard posts and barracks unless given special orders, separating them from the civilian German population. The wounds of post-war Germany are still fresh for many today. There are women alive today who labored in the ruins of Berlin, who spent their youth hiding from bloodthirsty soldiers, and who slaved away in the most desolate regions of Arctic Siberia for nothing more than a few moldy pieces of black bread. The political oppression of East Germany meant that many would not be able to speak of their experiences until German reunification and the dissolving of the German Democratic Republic in 1990. Scholars have had only 30 years to investigate the unique experiences of these female victims, and more is sure to be revealed as old forgotten records are brought to light. Such intense trauma passes down through the generations and will remain in the German psyche for many years to come.